All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of East October. So excited. Today is Single Mark Day, and I'm kind of declaring this as making your mark. There you go. Yeah, you know. All right, so enough with the dad jokes. We're going to get right into this. I am so excited. By the way, before we get started, we have the lovely Evie Herb painting with us today. Hey, everybody. <laughs> and... Uh, we have the beautiful voice of Eric Arcudi behind the scenes today, Hello. answering all the questions. And uh, we are really, really excited because we have a cool subject today. So, our subject, could you, maybe could you, since it is yours, sure. can you explain what it is? Did you forget what it was called? Oh, I'm sure I did. <laughs> so, you know, but you're in the camera shot. Yeah. Just so, you know, they can't see it now because you're... Oh. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, blessed box skull, um, which is like kind of a type of antelope, more or less, um, that I picked up last year. Uh, Tina and I went to Charlotte, North Carolina, to a uh, curio expo, and I found this there and thought it'd be a fun still life subject. Um, and it's been sitting here in the studio for months and months, and today is the day that we're finally breaking it out and going to have some fun with it. That is it. So I am super, super stoked about this. So I'm going to do a decently large painting today. And um, and we are uh, going to get started. So the, here's the goal. The goal is, is you're going to only make one mark with your brush and then with that you have to you have to make one mark and then you have to go back to your palette before you can make another mark now when saying that what is constitutes as a mark is if you like go with your brush around and it never leaves the pan panel then that's okay because m making your mark should be interesting and you should be thinking about how you can say a whole lot with one small mark, okay? So uh, when we walk through this, that's kind of the goal. So you'll see me kind of like keeping the brush on the canvas as I move it around, and then eventually I'll go back to the, the palette. And guys, this is not something I typically do. So I'm sure that my habits will make me every now and again do it, but the, the goal is to try to stay focused and intentional to try to only make one mark with your brush. So uh, this is gonna be just as much of a challenge as it is for you. The only difference I think is at the very beginning, I might not, I might, for the drawing, I might not um, do a single mark. I might just start like getting the drawing in. But once I kind of get the scale of the drawing in, then I'm gonna go straight to one mark at a time, going back to the palette and getting into the habit to keep the painting fresh. So this is basically a fresh exercise, but also an exercise for you to concentrate on exactly an interesting mark with your brush. So uh, maybe while you're mixing up, you can talk about what you're mixing up, and I'm gonna get some paint on my palette. Sure. I before I go in and sketch, um, I want to just do maybe at least three or four kind of base mixtures to go off and work on. Um, so right now I'm mixing up more of a uh, light tone for like the, um, I guess like bone itself on the skull. Um, and, um, a little bit of raw sienna. Um, I've got some yellow ochre and a little bit of lemon yellow from Michael Harding in here. And I think also just a touch of this um, manganese violet just to help neutralize it a little bit. 
Yeah, I'm really excited to paint this guy today. Um, it's been one since I've been here for quite a while, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Just um, move your camera just to touch it. Sure, better. yes. So we have a little bit different setup with the cameras today. Um, where I have everything vertical because we're working on vertical uh, paints. So let's see if we can do that. Let me know if you need me to. There's such a subtle, like, yellow cast to the bone surface. I'm going to be really careful to try to nail that color. Um, it's really subtle. This right here that I just put in is, what is this? Brilliant Yellow Kale from Williamsburg which I think is titanium based. Um, so yeah, kind of typically um, I do gravitate more towards lead white um, in general, but I do also use some colors that are titanium based as well. Um, so I'm not like totally anti-titanium, it's weird to say. Keep you doing a great job commenting, commenting <laughs> while I move cameras around. <laughs> um, but kind of like what the boys have talked about previously, um, I think my plan of attack for today um, is to just put in a rough sketch and kind of stumble in some quick background tones and then go in and start to really hone in on those brush strokes. Um, just to try to get like a nice solid foundation before we really start doing stroke at a time. I had even considered starting the drawing before we even started, uh, if I had had time, but I ran out of time getting all the cameras up where that way it was already, the structure was already there so we could go straight into like single marks. So feel free to draw with your brush or with your pencil or whatever you like to to get the, the armature of your painting ready to go before you dive into doing all these marks. So, and if you don't have a ginormous random skull lying around yes. your house, <laughs> um, I think for this kind of an exercise, any sort of object that has um, an interesting geometry to it while also kind of perhaps a consistent surface texture quality um, to allow you to really focus on accentuating the form with your brush strokes um, is something that I would recommend. But it being Halloween time, I think probably a lot of stores have like fake skulls and you know stuff like that lying around, I don't know. Yeah, you might be able to pick up a really cheap skull at your local Halloween shop. <laughs> if you're really desperate, you really want to paint a skull, tis the season to go to those little costume stores that pop up during the season. Get yourself something. All right. I'm just going to use like a basic transparent color, probably oxide yellow. So I can get myself sort of set up. I also do feel compelled to mention um, the person that I bought this skull from uh, did tell me specifically that it was ethically sourced. Um, so if anybody out there is concerned about that, um, hopefully that puts their minds at ease. Artist boy, we love to we love to paint. Uh, animals, and we can't get them to sit still, so taxidermy is one of our best friends. Taxidermy and skulls and different things. My favorite story is today of just somebody with that, with skeletal, skeletons and things like that is Daniel Sprake. 
finding that horse carcass and then took it to be cleaned and then get rearticulated as a full horse skeleton. An entire horse? Yes, an wow. entire horse skeleton. He was working on a huge commission um, that was, I believe, the four horsemen from Revelation and um, for a big climb. And so he used that, I think, as like the horse of death or one of the, one of the ones. I can't remember actually all of them. All of them represent. That sounds like no small undertaking. No, I don't think I think it was uh, quite a feat. If I, I wonder where he keeps it. <laughs> well, he has a this huge studio of space in the loft, and I've seen it in you know pictures and stuff mm. up in the loft. So, in just a second. I feel like he'll have some explaining to do if he ever has like. An unsuspecting house guest that stumbled across it. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there a horse in here? <laughs> well, it might be kind of like the dungeon situation because it's just his studio, it's like a big warehouse. There you go. So yeah. I think people kind of expect it. You have like artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of uh, open model, open figure nights there, which is really cool. So I typically will often will see somebody that I know in the art community there um you know drawing from a model to put to really post something about it so that's awesome yeah that's pretty cool my favorite story and i hope she wouldn't mind me mentioning it um about somebody that's like i don't know tech therapy related is uh carmen who painted with us what, last week? Two weeks ago? Uh-huh. Um, last week, I think. Uh, one of her favorite subjects to paint is her granddaughter. And uh, she told me a story about how anytime her granddaughter comes and visits, she always plays with the cute animals. <laughs> <laughs> As if they were like, you know, normal little plushies or something. Um, my dad had a deer in his office, a deer head. And my favorite thing to do is the little kids go and pet, pet the deer. You know, that was a lot of fun. I wonder who is joining us today. Our wonderful friends from around the world are coming around and hanging out with us. We have some people saying hello. So, Sean from Utah says good day. Hello, Sean. Hello, hello. Esteban from, says greetings from north of Sweden. I love the music at the beginning. <laughs> Sets the mood. Joyce from Washington says good morning. Joyce. Good morning to you. And good afternoon to our other folks on the, on the eastern side. <laughs> good morning, afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I also, that reminds me, I probably need to take my notifications off my phone. So that... Remind you too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks, hang on. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of pointless to do the single brush part in your drawing because, well, uh, it's just <laughs> it's just a drawing, and you know it's going to be the same color anyway. So, I used today's stream as an excuse to finally. Do some much needed brush washing. <laughs> um, I don't know about anybody else out there, but I can get a little bit lazy about it sometimes. Um, I have a habit of uh, often keeping my brushes overnight in mineral oil and then just rinsing them with Gamsol the next day before I go in. Um, 
So today, I actually was good and properly washed my brushes. You know, we all should do that every now and again. I, I'm the same way I put in oil and then, uh, you know, just a little be. But after this whole experience, I bet you for tomorrow, that might be what I do. It's like make sure I do a good wash um, of the brushes. We also have More hellos coming in. Nice. I have to look up the flag for this person, so I'm gonna come back to you. But Jonathan from Maine says hello. Uh, Alyssa from Australia says hello. Monsoon from Southern Turkey says hello. Wow. The whole crew. Awesome. Julie Measuresmith says hello. Hey, Julie. Matt says, finally, I have arrived. Oh. <laughs> Denise from New Jersey says, hey. And we have a hi from sunny Omaha. Omaha, That's So right. lots of people saying hello. I had a lot of friends there recently because uh, Ole Miss, my alma mater, won the World Series of Baseball there two years ago. And uh, it was the first World Series to win. So I had a lot of buddies going out to watch them play. That's my only Omaha fact. That and <laughs> that I know how to play Omaha po poker. <laughs> That's not it. How is Omaha poker different from normal poker? So poker basically has a parameter of like hands that win against other hands. And so um, the difference really comes down to how many cards are played and how they're, how people, there's like sometimes there'll be community cards that Everyone gets to play, they go into the center of the table to make the best hand of five cards. And uh, the most famous version of poker is Texas Hold'em. That's what most people play, which is you have five cards that are community cards that sit in the center of the table. And then there are another set of two cards that each of you have that no one else can see. And between your two cards and the cards that are on the table, you get to try to make the best hand, and then you bet according to that best hand. Um, Omaha basically gives you four cards to, that no one can see, and um, then five cards that are community that you can make the best five card hand. So it's crazy betting because everyone's got a really good hand, typically, because you have so many cards in your own hand to make with the ones on the board. So that's the main difference um, between Omaha and Texas Hold'em. But it is, anytime that I've played it, I've never played it at a tournament because the map is totally different. You have to learn all of the map in order to know the statistics and how I can play it. But um, anytime that I played in tournaments, it was always Texas Hold'em because that was what I knew. And the people that were usually playing Omaha were people that usually had far more money than I did to play with, and they, they, were, they were crazy. Boy, they were that crazy. You would just go watch them play because they would just have thousands and thousands, like tens of thousands of dollars in the pot Oof. for any given get, get moment. And I'm just like, yep, I'm a starting artist. I can't afford that. <laughs> can't afford that. So That would make me so anxious. I'm definitely not, a, not much of a gambler. I played, I've played penny slots before. My family always has a um, reunion uh, at Brigginton, I Brigginton Beach, Brigginton Island, which is right next to Atlantic City. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, growing up, going there once a year. Uh, when I was little, my cousins would take me 
into like the Harrah's or something and uh, could do penny slots together. But aside from that. Yeah, I hear you. Well, probably best that way. Um, back in my college years, I actually did it semi professional with Harrah a lot. Um, I remember so, you mentioning that. I forget yeah. about that. Um, well, before I was seriously dating my wife, uh, there was a season about six months where I was like, hey, I'm going to try my hand at it. I had a whole spreadsheet, did the whole thing. I did really well. Um, the only problem is I hated it afterwards. I hated doing it. So um, I made enough to where I was like, you could make a serious living doing this. But the problem was is that every weekend you're at the casino instead of hanging out with your friends and uh, you're eating crappy food. You know, at the buffet, because you can, you get free meals basically brought to you if you pay to play the whole time. But it was not good food for you, and um, your friends end up being, you know, a bunch of people who, you know, they're like retired people that well, not retired people, but it's just like you, there's this particular demographic of people that would always be there, and you just see the same faces, and it just wasn't the crowd I liked hanging around. Not your scene. Wasn't my scene. So, I got over it. <laughs> and uh, then my art career took off, and the rest is history. All right, I almost have enough basic lines down to where I feel like I can move to the next stage. You know, I didn't want to get it perfect. I just want to get scale, position down, and work from there. Because part of the freshness is using a bit of the marks to create a drawing. But sometimes the imperfections that make the painting beautiful. So, so I'm going to use a lot of the drawing parts of this as part of the way I'm getting energy in the painting. All right, so we have hello from Elmo from Brazil. So thank you, Paul, for helping me out with that flag. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then Evie, can you remind us what type of animal skull that we are painting? Yes, um, kind of a weird name. I can spell it for you. It's called a blesbok, B-L-E-S-B-O-K, I believe. Um, there's also another species that's called a gemsbok, which is similar, but this one in particular, I believe, is a blesbok. It's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> I will say, um, I was making the joke yesterday that it almost sounds like something Dr. Seuss would make up. You know, can't you can't you just hear a Blesbach being one of his poems? Totally, absolutely. Sue from Virginia says hello. Hey Sue. So you're too close. You gotta come visit. <laughs> I bet Virginia is looking really pretty right now. Oh, wow. All the leaves and everything. Yeah, she be. be a great time to go. All right, I've got down what I want, and now I'm going to just start. Making some paint, mixing some paint, mixing slash making. <laughs> I tell you, as I get to the bottom of this lead wire, I know I've said it every day before, it is, it is like concrete now, trying to get it out. So I'm going to have to get one of those little mechanical. I've got some here. Do you want some? Uh, yeah, it's fine. I, I've already got the paint out. Okay. So we're good. Okay. And, and I have a whole other tube of lead wire that just didn't. <laughs> hey, Lewis. Yes. Um, some are saying that it sounds like you're not mic'd up, but I can hear you fine in my volume. Mm. 
Hmm. That one's an interesting one. Sound is fuzzy on this end too. Well, in the meantime, while Louis figures out uh, some audio stuff really quickly, uh, a little bit about what I'm working on at the moment. I'm trying to really quickly mix up um, some background tones. Just do one really quickly for the shadows that are being cast by the skull um, on the cloth and then one for the light in the cloth. I'm gonna scumble those in around really quick and then go ahead and get into making some of these delicious marks that we've been talking about. All right, everyone, this should sound better. Um, I actually had one of my features clicked off. So um, let, let us know if this sounds better to you, but it should be all fixed. Thank you, audience, for letting us know when sometimes when we're doing tests, there are many, many points of failure. And so it is helpful sometimes when y'all let us know what is going on. So thank you. Okay, enough of that. Mixing time. We have Hello from Northern Idaho, Nikki from Northern Idaho, Emily Fossum's here. Hey. It's so fun to hear familiar names. I love it. What was the person's name from Idaho? I didn't Nikki. get it. Nikki. Hi, Nikki. And the mm. sound sounds better. Good. Wonderful. Sorry, awesome. everyone. I uh, just didn't click one of the boxes that I needed to click. That's how life is sometimes, right? Yep. Just got to click the box. <laughs> it's funny because when we're doing these live streams, you know, of course, this is not something that was even a thing until we started doing it, but... You know, if you watch, like, say, a sports broadcast or a news broadcast, you know, like, oh, you know, it's just, how complicated could it be, you know? Well, it is very complicated. You have only 27 different wires going in and out of computers and going into other things in order to come out again. And, you know, it's just, it's just there, we have, like, seven different programs running. And um, all that to say is it's, it's a joy to do, and I'm... Excited that we get to do it. The te technology is capable for us to do it now, but um, it can scramble your brain a little bit to like think about. Okay, this needs to feed into here, and then it needs to go out to there. But if I if I don't have this canceled, then we're going to create like you know reverberation or echo or you know. So um, it's a whole new world of learning. Yeah, Lewis has. From doing this and dealing with all the tech and everything, he's really become like full-time artist slash full-time <laughs> audio engineer slash full-time videographer. <laughs> Just slash full-time. <laughs> uh, he's a man with many hats to wear. There's certainly so much that goes on behind the scenes in order to make this happen. Maybe uh, whenever we do make a blooper reel, we'll have oh, to man. include some like shots showing like the extent of the equipment and everything involved. We could make an amazing blooper reel. Um, I need to I need to do that all the way from the inception, like some of the videos that we first did when Michael Klein, Josh LaRock, and I were making our first set of videos in New York City, and the amount of bloopers that we had for those that I think are still saved, archived, deep in the belly of some of my like hard drives. Um, boy, it would be great to pull that out. It would also be great to see what I look like 10 years younger <laughs> without a beard. <laughs> I know, every time I see a photo of you without a beard, I'm just like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? I've been threatening to, to everybody here that I'm just gonna show up one day beardless. So, it's gonna happen. That's Actually, your, I think that I'm could gonna, be your Halloween costume. That could be. The, the beardless man. 
<laughs> it could be. Um, it's it's funny though, because I, I I think emotionally that'd be too traumatizing. I'd have to like slowly taper down. You to don't it. have to get. You we can all <laughs> tell that you like having it. You can, I've you can I've had it. have enjoyed it, but um, you know I also like changing things up after a couple of years. So we'll change it up and it can grow back. So what is that? There's like a there's a meme online that says something to the effect of like facial hair is men's makeup. Yes. Um, and then there's, what, it's a picture of Jason Momoa just as Jason Momoa and then a photo of him like photoshopped with no facial hair. <laughs> um, it's pretty funny to look at if y'all have ever seen that. One of my favorite quotes that I've heard is um, beards, making uh, ugly, man look, ugly men look looking good since the dawn of time. <laughs> making ugly men look good since the dawn of time. All right, so I'm going to probably try to make the background maybe not a drapery, but maybe kind of like a painted, rustic-y wood something. Ooh. But same color, just make it look flat and kind of as if it's hanging on an old barn wall or something. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying like the soft sort of like gray purpley color in this fabric. I think um, I have a wash on my panel that I toned initially with green and then I went um, over it with more of an orange wash with mm -hmm. a transparent red oxide and Indian yellow. And the way that this purple is vibrating with that, some of like the orangey yellow coming through, um, I'm really liking the look of that. Nice. We have a question here from Esteban. Do you guys ever erase with something? What would be the best material? Just Ooh. a rag? Do you ever sand your paintings? I'm not sure watching. Oh, oh uh, I think he watched a video where someone was sanding, mentioned mm -hmm. sanding the painting. I have only ever sanded one painting um, in the hopes, it was a study for a portrait that I did and I was like, I don't need this study, I wanna reuse the panel. And so I sanded uh, the study in the hopes of reusing the panel and honestly what I ended up doing in the end was just flipping it over and using the other side and gessoing the other side and prepping it. Yeah. Um, so I've never really sanded a piece for the intention of like going back into it in that way. Um, but uh, occasionally I'll use Q-tips. It honestly kind of depends on like how much surface area you're trying to remove. Um, Q-tips are good. What I actually really, really love are um, you can find these like wedge-shaped makeup sponges at pharmacies um, that are used. Women use them for like makeup remover and stuff. Um, and you know they're really pretty cheap. They're probably bad for the environment, but um, they're like this big. They're wedge-shaped, and um, that kind of as an eraser gives you a lot of control over like how precise or like how wide you need it to be. Almost like. If you imagine the end of a highlighter pen, um, kind of gives you that same degree of control of like thick and thin. Um, yeah, what about you, Louis? Um, one thing that I typically do, especially if I'm drawing or something, I'll always keep one brush, typically a, a hard brush or a, some sort of like either hog's hair or ivory or something that has just a tiny amount of lean medium and no paint on it. And I'll use it to, to erase uh, a line. And that works really well. So it just depends on, the only time I would use sandpaper is if I'm trying to soften an area or if there's like a heavy amount of mark, like impasto -y marks that have like brush mark on it, that, that I might, use sandpaper to kind of bat down 
a bit of the brush work so that I still have room to, to um, still have, basically have a smooth surface. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things and lost my train of thought. I also really like, um, as an alternative to just normal sandpaper, um, I really like sanding blocks, um, especially for like working with, you know, ACM panels, which are very flat. Um, I find that the sanding blocks actually like give you something to like really grip onto. Um, and I, I find that they actually allow me to work a little bit faster than just using a sheet of sandpaper. Do you consider the materials you've painted with um, when regarding sanding? For example, you would you sand anyway if you've used lead white or would you mm. avoid it because you're using lead? I would avoid it with lead for sure, but that's just me. I think it's better to avoid it. However, if you're so determined, uh, you can wet sand it. So uh, I know several painters who will that use lead white and want to sand down, they'll just add a little bit of water to their sand and they'll wet sand it down a bit. Um, but typically if you're gonna do that, it's usually to bat, just bat down some of the brush grain in the paint to make it a bit smoother. And they do it very softly. But, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a tough one. Um, Cause that's, I, yeah, I think that's I, kind I of like up to the individual. Yeah, you know, and do it at your own risk. <laughs> Might depend also on how large the area you're trying to sand. If it's getting rid of a small area with ridges, then maybe you can do it in a more controlled way, but mm -hmm. maybe not recommending it on a larger scale. Yeah. 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 If you do choose to do that over lead, definitely do it outside and definitely wear mm -hmm. some form of a respirator that is rated for dust, dust particulate. Yeah. Um, and that's a really important thing that a lot of people kind of forget about is that different respirators and different masks are rated for different purposes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely be careful to check that. Read all the labels. <laughs> it's funny because that was the first time I ever heard of an N95 mask way before pandemic seasons, you know, from George O'Hanlon being like, use this. And like one of the ones was an N95 mask that you would get from the store, from the like hardware store from like Lowe's. So it was funny because when the pandemic hit, I was like, I wonder, I think I have an N95 mask. And like went into my garage and found two dusk masks that were N95 rated. Yeah, I had a bunch kind of similarly. I had a bunch on hand from... Uh, Working with ceramics and yeah, like clay. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, glazes, man. Those those are just as toxic, if not more, sometimes. I mean, even just sweeping the floor. Oh, I <laughs> like know. The amount the of silicone and stuff. clay particulate. Yeah, silicosis is real. Um, oh, I just went over. Well, yeah. here here's a perfect example of erasing, right here. I just went over where I, what my skull spot would be. So I, I just took a little bit of. Well, in that sense, I took Gamsol, but usually I get lean medium, and I'll just push it in with a clean brush up. And in the spirit of one mark, I'm doing it all with one mark. I'm trying to stay true to the, to the vision. There you go. We have a question about your palette, Lewis. Mm-hmm. What is the red between alizarin and the yellow on your palette? That is vermilion made by Rublev, natural pigments. Fancy. And it lasts forever, but it is the most expensive color I think I have on my palette. So, um, but I bought it like five years ago. So they, it, they, it just keeps a really long time. So, you, you know, it doesn't dry out on you. So it's a great color. I love it. But yeah, it's, it's great. Try it out. I once ground, like hand ground my own lapis. 
<laughs> to make a paint out of. I think it took me like a week. <laughs> wow. Um, it ended up being a gorgeous paint, but oof. There's a reason why some of these are so expensive. It, it gave me a new appreciation for that. Yeah. You know, that's one thing that I'm so glad that people have an interest in, but I just absolutely don't have an interest in, <laughs> is, uh, is like mixing and grinding my own paint and pigment. Um, I have too many interests as it is, so I, don't, I couldn't have, I, I mean, if I had five lifetimes, I still wouldn't be able to like, do all the things I wanna do. So it's like, it's okay that that one is not an interest of mine. <laughs> but um, hats off to all the people who do enjoy that kind of thing. Like Evie. I'm a masochist, what can I say? I do actually, I think, I find it meditative. Um, you know, obviously you don't have time for it all the time, but um, it definitely gave me a different appreciation for the materials that we're able to just buy, you know. Um, aside from the dollar value, I think that that has a really inherent value in and of itself and just the amount of time that it would save if that weren't an option. Mm. Tell you because this painting is so high and that I am working from a distance, I'm gonna get a serious deltoid workout today. <laughs> I'm already feeling the burn. We're only like 30 minutes in. Marjorie. Sorry, I read that incorrectly. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Margie from Minnesota says hi. Hi, Margie. Hello. Glad you could join us. I'm gonna imagine that the shadow goes all the way off the canvas here. We also have hello from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. This is a historical place. And we have a question. Has anybody tried lead sulfate? I mold my own lead pigments because it's much cheaper than buying it. Mm. That is one great way to save money and have high quality paints. No, I have never used lead sulfate um, that I'm aware of. I haven't either, but I'm actually kind of curious to try it. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. I think uh, this weekend, so long as I have time, I actually have some um, carmine that I extracted myself uh, while I was sick last week because I was so hopelessly bored while being sick <laughs> and out of the studio. Um, so I've got some carmine at home that I want to uh, percolate into a lake pigment and mull. Right. Are there any pigments that either of you would love to try but just haven't done it yet? Um, I always screw up the pronunciation of this. Orp mint? Orp mint? Which one is it? I cannot uh, remember. I don't know why. It's a yellow. It's a really actually historically significant yellow pigment um, hmm. that is not easy to come by and also expensive. But um, I have always wanted to try it. Well, that sounds pretty cool. I've um, Let's just say that all the paint colors I do not have on my palette, I'm interested in trying. <laughs> there you go. So, um, you do get used to using colors because you know how to control them. So, I have my go-tos, but especially for things like this program that we're doing right now, those are the times where I'd love to experiment. So, for example, the cobalt teal. Um, 
definitely wanted to try that out and give it a go, and I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the control over a wide expanse of color uh, it was very interesting that I could make pretty much any color available with it, as long as I had a, a medium chromatic dark color. That was the only colors that I found sometimes could be a challenge to create, were some of the darker chromatic colors. But overall, it was cool. I had a, fun, a lot of fun playing with that. I actually, to add to that, um, I just thought of one. I really, really, really want to try malachite. Um, mm. It's not used very much anymore because it is a semi-precious gemstone and it is really expensive, kind of like lapis. Um, but uh, I have seen it on historical manuscripts. Um, I actually went to... Uh, the library at Trinity College in Dublin a few years ago mm -hmm. and got to see the Book of Kells and the the room that they have the Book of Kells displayed in they have a huge um, exhibit or at least they used to uh, accompanying it that talks all about historical pigments and the pigments that no were used joke. for illumination and it's fascinating I love it so much I think I have some pictures saved somewhere on my computer um but one of the pigments that they used in the Book of Kells was malachite. And ever since then, I've always wanted to try it just because it's like the richest, yummiest green. Um, yeah. If anybody out there has ever tried it or wants to try it, would love to hear about that. Is malachite fugitive? Um, no, it should not be. It is considered an earth pigment, um, like ochre. Okay. Um, so it should not be fugitive at all. Cool. I know people are begging to hear that I'm having fun. <laughs> hey, it only took you like 45 minutes. I hadn't there said you it go. yet. Yeah. I'm just saying that people are probably really wanting me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that loophole there? Uh huh. I, I saw yeah. it. <laughs> One of the reasons I wanted to paint this is because I think that it has so much energy and interesting texture as a, the skull, but also because I feel like it, it just calls for a really painterly style, brushwork style painting, you know, which I'm just so jazzed about, you know. It was, I think, perfect for this kind of challenge. Yeah, I mean, the lines, from the angularity of the skull itself mm -hmm. um, to just, like, the amazing curvature of these horns, there's so much variety in edges um, that I think really lends itself to an opportunity to really explore brushwork. Yeah. Yeah, just so cool. People in the comments here are sharing their love for, is it Malachite? Mal Malachite, mm -hmm. yeah. Malachite, Malachite. Malachite, that's awesome. Jonathan says, I have a medium I got a number of years ago from a now defunct company called Studio Products, Inc. I believe it has lead and black oil in it. Are there Ooh. any companies that make something like that now? I know Zecchi in Florence makes black oil, but I'm not sure here. Black uh, oil? Natural Pigments makes a black oil. Is that like pressed from black seed? What is that pressed from? I'm, I'm not sure. Isn't it like boiled with lead? It's something like that. Yeah, it's definitely boiled in some way, shape, or form. And it was like the secret sauce of so many people. The problem is, is that it has a high propensity to like, if you use a lot of it to like, reduce the longevity of the painting. It dries know. quickly. Mm -hmm. And so mm. if you aren't aware of how to, you know, manage that, you know. Oh, gosh. Could if I could just day. teleport to Zeki's right now. I miss that so much. Mm. There also was um, a little, 
uh, not little, huge uh, yarn shop that was tucked away nearby behind the Duomo that I used to go to all the time. Um, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, oh my gosh, I loved it. Filati is mm. yarn, I think. One of the few Italian words I actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was that hopeless American tourist. Um, I tried, I really did try. Um, cause you know, I think it's like a sign of respect anywhere you travel to try to like really imbue yourself into the culture. And a big part of that is trying to spend energy and time learning the language. Um, but I'm decently fluent more or less in Spanish. So I could understand a lot of Italian, even though sometimes I couldn't reciprocate and speak back. Um, but maybe one of these days. I could convince either Erica or Lewis to give me Italian lessons. Uh, Erica. Erica. <laughs> uh, my, my Italian practice is 20 years old, so Erica is, you know, 20 times more proficient than I am. Jake and I have actually considered, we don't know yet where we're going to go for our honeymoon, but we have thought about Italy. We're not sure yet. Here's a good example of like where I might have made a mark, but it might not have been the perfect shape. But to go back to your painting, get some more paint instead of like trying to make the shape again. Because if you try to make it again with, with less paint on your brush, it's just going to start creating a soft edge and kind of smear a little bit and you won't get like this fresh, colorful mark. So just going back to the paint, looking at it, Assessing and then re-adding to that spot is one of those tricks that at least I use. I don't even know if it's like one of the main tools of the trade, but it's absolutely how I try to keep my marks fresh. It seems to be about confident, meaningful mark making. Mm -hmm. versus an aesthetic decision of freshness. It's like if it's confident and meaningful, then you, you are, you're already covered with, <laughs> with, uh, with freshness. You're, I think like I like to think of it as like every stroke is a declaration of something. Like mm -hmm. every stroke that you want to say something must say something and can say something. And so, like, I think there's a level of confidence involved in that that um, I think is good to practice because I think sometimes I can be a little timid in my mark making um, or just kind of like, you know, oh, I want to try this. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. Um, so having the opportunity today to just be like, nope, make the mark. Um, it's really exciting. It's a lot of fun. Mm. You know, something I'm also noticing to add to what you're saying is you, it also prevents me from doing a lot of little marks at the beginning mm -hmm. because like that means I have to go back down here and go up here and go back down so that it, it actually pushes your laziness to your advantage to like think about how you can say a lot with one stroke that goes you know maybe all the way down the antlers Hey, efficient laziness is my favorite kind. <laughs> oh, see? It's great. I can't remember what CEO I heard, but there was a CEO out there that was like, you're so productive. How do you get it all done? He's like, honestly, it is. it all derives from my laziness and trying to find the best way of doing things so I don't have to do it again. You know, I was like, oh, that's a good way of thinking. Yeah, totally valid. I think I do actually, however, want to take just a brief second to really quickly sketch out the placement of the um, nose and the eye socket and some of the structure in behind there um, towards the cranium in the back, just really, really quickly. Because um, I feel like once I get going in the mode of like very declarative, big, bold strokes, um, if I'm not careful to really 
try to accurately map out things right now, I could see myself getting caught up in drawing errors that I would like to avoid. At all costs. At all costs. Hey, they happen though. Yep. Matt mentions that he practices his market making by going full abstract in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great way of doing it. It's a really great way. In fact, you can gain a lot of energy. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, it can create a, 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 a muddy mess. But if you know what you're doing, it can create a whole lot of energy in a painting to do that. It's awesome. I might have to try that. Sounds like a lot of fun. Monsoon mentions still life with an animal skull so much reminds me of Georgia O'Keeffe's masterpiece. Mm. The eyes. Love yeah. her. They had a Georgia O'Keeffe exhibition here in North Carolina at the North Carolina Museum of Art a few years ago. And um, I got to go see it and I fell absolutely even more in love with Georgia O'Keeffe. Although I think I love her work. I wouldn't, I'm not ever really interested in painting in kind of the way she painted, but that's what I love so much about it is like I, I appreciate it and I want to do something different while taking like some of those lessons and, and seeing the value in it anyways. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the beauty of art? There's so many people that I absolutely adore that have no desire to paint like. Um, and, you know, there's so much appreciation in, in just the, the idea of poetry and creating works of art that allows for us to connect to something else that's inside of us that we're not, that resonates with us. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we're inspired to paint that way. We just enjoy the fact that somebody is connecting to some part of us that we are now discovering. You well know? said. Absolutely. I believe, if I remember correctly from looking at Lewis's vantage point, I believe it's showing up pretty well on his side too, but I love there's um, a really nice uh, moment kind of underneath the eye socket where kind of like on a human face, like where the tear duct would be. Um, and there's a really just gorgeous swoopy shape um, that's being formed going underneath the eye that I think is really descriptive of the type of animal that it is, that it is you know, related to a deer um, or an antelope. Um, and that's something I want to be mindful of accentuating as I go forward. Erica, have you ever painted any animal skulls before? I don't know. I'm, I don't think so. Trying, I feel like for some reason that's impossible, but yeah, I, <laughs> I'm yeah. like, how could I have not have painted? I was just thinking, because I, I, I was trying to think like from your work, I'm not sure that I've ever seen one. I don't think I have. Well, maybe we'll have to have another. Oh, there'll be this, this another will... day with this guy. Yep. Oh my gosh, I would love it. We um, should name him. We should name him. If anybody out there has name ideas for him, we can take a poll. Erica, I'm sorry. I feel like I interrupted you there. What were you saying? You would love it? Um, I would love to paint this guy. Yeah. Those horns are so beautiful. They really are. Mm. That's what I love, I think, the most about painting animals and just, you know, subjects from nature in general is just the amount of appreciation 
that I can get mm -hmm. for this animal by spending this kind of time with it. Um, and, you know, hopefully trying to honor it. Um, and, you know, the fact that it was once a living thing um, and trying to honor that. Um, I find a lot of poetry and meaning in that for me personally. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, we have several animals here that have been either generously donated to us or that we've purchased for the purpose of painting. And, um, and um, we have a beautiful medical skeleton that is real. And um, all, in all cases, we love them in the sense that we have a deep respect for them and we want to honor them by by representing them sometimes in our in our work. So but we also appreciate it if they're ethically acquired, you know. Yeah. So On a different topic, we have some jokes coming in. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Why did the sh oh, why did the artist add sugar to her paint? Hmm. To make it more palatable. Yeah. <gasps> oh. Oh, that's so good. I love it so much. I might have to steal that from you. <laughs> that's awesome. And Nikki mentions human skulls are great for learning anatomy, but a bit creepy. Good study yep. for Halloween. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. I, I always make the joke here that I want to be that guy that like the kids ride their bikes in front of the house and it's like there's <laughs> kind of like old man Jenkins or something, you know, there's there's old man Louie. I'll be the has, wicked witch of the neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. And he, he has that, he has a dead body in his basement and, you know, he killed his son when he was younger, you know, <laughs> like make it up a whole story and then come out, I'll come out with the cane and be like, <laughs> the kids like I'll go, oh, scram! <laughs> you know. I totally want to be that guy. For those who can't tell, we all love Halloween around here. Very, very excited. I wish I could have everybody over for our Halloween party because it's gonna be epic. It's gonna be so much fun. It is. I need to figure out what I'm gonna cook. I know. Uh, I'll be making my witch's brew which for any of you out there is a spiced apple cider that I love to make every year. Um, and for any who participate, can make it a, more of an adult beverage. I'll have options. But it's always one of my favorite things in this season is, is apple cider. I love like mold. Apple cider, mm -hmm. throwing in some cinnamon, cinnamon sticks and um, some clove. Some clove. Actually, when I was when I was a little kid, my mom taught me a technique that she uses for mulling cider, where she takes um, several clementines and mm. studs the outside of the clementines with the cloves, mm -hmm. and then slices the clementines so that. The clementine juices release as it cooks, mm. but then the, you don't have like a bunch of clove bits floating around. They're all kept together. Yeah, um, it's a great, great cider hack. You know, I've I've seen that and never known why. Just that to is keep so it, cool. Yeah. Just to keep it from like you know, because I have to always strain the clove bits out yep. and all the you know and the allspice. Yep. Of course, I guess it doesn't really work for the allspice because they're like little balls. Yeah, but. I think for that maybe if you had like a little mesh um, or actually I can bring some. I have some little um, muslin reusable tea bags at home. I Sweet. Bring, bring yeah, it, bring it. Tis the season for some cozy cider. Nikki says I want to make some. Mm. Yeah, now I'm kind of craving some. I might have to have some tonight. Yep. And another uh, seasonal favorite thing of autumn bonfire ghost stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds amazing. 
I have not had a bonfire yet this season. I feel like um, my fiance and I love having bonfires every year and like, you know, just sitting out back, telling stories, talking, reading books, roasting s'mores. Um, just enjoying the sweet spot this yeah, time of year. Yeah, it just it smells is... so good. The smell of like the wood smoke with the falling leaves. Like the way the autumn smells is just... Mm, it's the best, isn't so it? So nice. Last night would have been the perfect night for a fire oh, because yeah. it wasn't too, so cold that you still had to bundle up and like hunker over the fire. But it was cold it was enough cold that enough. you could be cozy by it. And you wouldn't sweat, Yeah, you know? Like it was, it was just the absolute perfect night for it. We had a bonfire at our house, uh, I think it was maybe three years ago. And um, I was wearing a pair of boots at the time that I thought were leather. And I found out they were not leather. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, because I had my feet a little too close to the fire and they started melting. No! It's <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> well, silver lining, you saved a cow, you know. Yeah. Or whoever go. made them saved a cow. <laughs> Uh, even though I could like go straight down, I'm not because I want to create some interesting texture in the antlers. So kind of just pushing the paint around and letting the mark making of the paint make a statement. Do you have a particular um, brush that you're kind of excited to use for this mark making today? Oh, that's a... Good question. I don't know if I have one that I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to use this one. But I am wanting, I've been more excited about making like the painting have a, have the mark be a large role of the painting. So mm -hmm. um, making sure that I'm thinking thoughtfully about what brushes I am using. So I'm, I've started with just some hog's hair brushes natural hair brushes and kind of creating some decent impasto-y moments and then kind of pushing them over with softer brushes later is the, is the plan. Nice. I haven't used it yet, but I have one that I'm excited to go in with once I've created a little bit more impasto and gotten just more paint on my surface. I'll hold mm -hmm. it up really quickly. Um, Honestly, I have abused this poor brush <laughs> so hard. <laughs> but actually, I really like the way it behaves because of its abuse <laughs> that it suffered. Um, it's a rosemary bristle dagger. Um, and I don't know if how well you can see on camera. It's like... Yeah, if you put it up to your... Yeah. To the dark should. area. Yeah, it has these like really wiry, strandily... Can you move it slightly to the... To the left, yes, like that. Sorry. More. Perfect. Um, yeah, I love this brush. Um, you can kind of like, I mean, you can really whack at a painting with this and use it really hard, or you can be really, really gentle and it just have these little tiny wiry bits at the very end, just barely graze the surface. Um, so I'm excited about this guy today. I love that, so much character. Mm. It's the, <laughs> the one plus side of mistreating your brushes. <laughs> sometimes you end up with some fun effects from it. An Eevee original brush. That's there you it. go. An Eevee original. I think one of the things to, to consider is just don't be afraid to just put down a mark and not worry about if it's perfect because there's just so much energy and in just an interesting mark. And, you know, we're not painting a face and having to get the perfect identity down. We're, we're working on trying to, like, build some character in this, in this painting. Yeah, I think in that way, painting an animal skull is maybe a little bit less kind of a, a pressure cooker situation than painting mm. a human skull. Yeah. Because 
you know, painting a human skull, if you get something funky with the anatomy, I mean, it's going to pop right out at you. Um, but, you know, here, if we get something a little bit wonky, yeah, you know, unless you're like a biologist or something, you know, it's, it's okay. It's a little bit uh, less stressful from an anatomy standpoint. So I guess Lewis does have a background in biology, so. <laughs> it's true. Biochemistry. Biochemistry. Yeah. Um, which, boy, I, I loved it so much, but I, I loved painting more. I, um, one of my favorite experiences is in my senior year, I went for her for three months to live on a tiny little four-acre island in Belize and just scuba dived every day to do marine biology research for uh, studying the health of coral heads. Mm. And it was just a blast. How many years ago was this? Because um, I'm sure that kind of research would have yielded very different results today. Well, they do it every year for the purpose of seeing the progress. Mm. Uh, but yes, and, and they already had at that point data from the island to how much the island itself had shrunk. Wow. Um, and yeah, we were, we were measuring um, things called flamingo tongues, which were, was a certain type of sea slug that was a really good correlating predictor of the health of the coral head because of... The, of, um, it's kind, they kind of are like a parasite. Be like, you know, how healthy is your house by seeing how many cockroaches are running around? You know, <laughs> it's kind of the same oh, idea. No. Um, and so the more you see, the he less healthy the, the coral head was. And um, they, they had some sort of propensity to, I can't remember what it was that, that pushed them to um, have... I don't think that they directly caused the bleaching, but they, they were just a litmus test. So that and um, I think it was butterfly fish. Butterfly fish also were a predictor of the health of the coral head because um, too many butterfly fish was unhealthy for the reef. And I can't remember, it's been too long. Hmm. But The only one that I know about in that regard is um... Is it the sunflower starfish mm -hmm. um, that contribute to bleaching? There's actually, this is so off topic, sorry guys, but. Um, <laughs> it's okay, <That's>, they, <laughs> they, they come for, for the conversation though. But yeah, you know, we uh, wax poetic in many different directions. Exactly. Um, there's actually a really, really good documentary um, on Netflix about coral bleaching and kind of the state of emergency that our coral global mm, ecosystem mm -hmm. is under. It's called Chasing Coral. I'll send it to you if you haven't seen it. It's so good. You would love it. I would love it. If marine biology was just doing what I did, I mean, I, I would have like been a marine biologist, but then you learn the realities of what it's really like to be a marine biologist, which is you scuba dive like a couple of times a year, and then the rest of the year you're in an office putting the data into a computer. Mm. And I was like, mm, no, I don't think that's for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I accidentally just did two marks with the same brush. You weren't Strike. on the screen so at the time. Oh, so. good. Perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. Nobody needs to know. <laughs> I'm still just Dodged gonna... a bullet and then told Except everybody. We <laughs> I feel like Lewis and I are working on different areas. I'm sort of just like tiling in right now a little bit. But I am like trying to think in terms of like the drama of the strokes um, and how I want those to play with the shadow shapes on the form. Mm. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun so far. Oh, somebody else Ooh. said it. My turn. Good. Needed to be somebody else's <laughs> turn. I've said it enough. Some of our audience is discussing what they're currently painting Ooh. or planning to paint. 
And Nikki says, I am soon planning to paint an underwater swimmer about to emerge from the depths to the light. Ooh. It is for, for illustrating a beautiful short story my daughter wrote. Just oh, that was cool. I love that. Oh. Well, your daughter's lucky to have you. That's always something. I do want to be a parent someday, and that's always something that like I've kind of looked forward to mm. about that in the back of my mind. It's like, oh, I want to draw with my kid. I want to paint with my kid. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, one day. One day for the both of us. I used to do that. Um, growing up, I would babysit for my neighbors all the time and um, you know, help watch my dad's kids and stuff like that. And I think after a little while, the kids always knew, like, oh, Evie's here. Get out the art supplies. <laughs> <laughs> they tolerated me pretty well. Honestly, you'd be my, like, favorite babysitter for sure. Be <laughs> like, she's bringing the art supplies. I had, yeah. oh, my gosh, in the 90s, I had this one babysitter that I will never forget. Um... Uh, well, for a variety of reasons, but uh, one of which is she had this like craft kit that she would bring with her um, that was kind of like an easy bake oven, but instead of like making cute little baked goods, you made squirmy plastic bugs. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It sounds really weird, but I loved it. Um, oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I grew up with two brothers, so I was a little bit of a tomboy, but... Um, Oh, I, I love that. It's squirmy plastic bugs all the way. <laughs> There's like a little mass kind of pushing out in the form right here. Um, and I'm, I'm not really sure what, maybe that's like part of the nasal cavity uh, meeting up with the rest of the skull. I'm not really sure what's what's under there or what, you know, that's all about. But I do want to make sure to try to capture that form kind of coming out a little bit right here. Um, I love... all of the subtlety of everything happening in the shadows right now. Um, such a cool form to paint. Matt says I made those plastic bugs. Oh, yes! I'm not the only one. That makes me so happy. <laughs> it is awesome. Yeah, man. There were some weird kids' toys in the 90s. I don't know. And kids' shows. Kids' shows in the 90s were, like, kind of disturbing. I feel that way about also, like, the late 70s and early 80s shows. Like, I look back to some of the, like, PBS shows... There's one called the um, Alphabet People that today still haunts my dreams. Like it was, you know, it was a kid's show, but the, the, just the people looked so creepy. Ugh. And I was just like, oh man, I, yeah, I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> so, but yeah. As a kid, I had, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's funny in hindsight, but as a kid, I had terrible nightmares about this like space glob monster from a math blaster computer game <laughs> that my mom nice. made my brothers and I play. And this monster like kidnaps a cute little robot character and I don't know why, but it gave me nightmares for like a year. <laughs> That's crazy. And I think, I don't know, maybe subconsciously it, it Contributed to why I don't like math so much. Um, who knows? Opposite of the intended effect. Right, exactly. Oh. I have a twin brother who loves math. Um, and growing up, he was always very generous to, you know, help me with my homework and stuff. But, yeah, I'm not the math twin. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here from Edward. I wonder if you know or could recommend someone who paints with titanium white or other non-lead white 
um, but also has lots of texture or brushwork shown in the paintings. Or perhaps if you're using titanium, how you can incorporate texture in your painting. Um, well, I, I actually mix my lead white with titanium whenever I'm painting a painting like this. And um, it's just more about loading your brush with a lot of paint and doing exactly what we're talking about here, which is um, making one mark and leaving it. So if you do that, the, the texture stays. Uh, the problem with a lot of people is they'll put the mark down and they'll keep pounding that mark until there's nothing left of it. Uh, so this at least helps kind of level the playing field if you just leave it. And so that energy will stay in the painting. Yeah, so. I've actually only been painting with lead white for several months now. Um, and, you know, prior to that, I was using titanium. Um, and I made that switch for several reasons, but I still really love um, the hold that titanium paint has, um, which is one of the reasons why I still do use a number of paints that are titanium based. Um, but yeah, and I think that's true for a lot of people. You know, I think it's, there's such a like, I don't know, funny like, dichotomy of like oh do you use lead or titanium or cremnitz or flake mm. or i don't know like artists get like so like up into like what white are you using and yeah um use them all yeah i mean i use yeah. i use you're right and that's that's i don't use them all i use titanium and lead but um for the people out there i i, I use i use different varieties and they're all great i actually think that Titanium works great for a la prima painting. Um, I tend to cut it because I do think it's a little overpowering. So I cut it with lead just to make it have a, less of a tinting power. But anyway, I think the EV speaks truth. I think it's an opportunity as well if you're just using, meaning if you're only using titanium white and you're not having an additive or, or cutting it with something like that, um, if you're trying to get texture, it's an opportunity to see what different brushes you can use. For example, a bristle brush versus a synthetic or sable brush will leave a different kind of mark. And so perhaps if you're looking for texture, um, a bristle brush or something with um, it's a little bit harder, maybe with it leaving a stroke, leaving the uh, texture of the hair behind um, mm. could help you. Yeah. And I like what you said, Lewis, about, you, I mean, you can still create an impasto with titanium. You just, just put more paint, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Right. Like, um, there's, it's almost like you, maybe you need to have have a little bit more than if you had lead in order for it to create that bodied impasto, but um, you can still, like you can push, you can almost exaggerate it in order to get some texture. Yeah, exactly. And uh, another thing that now that you're saying that, that I wasn't even considering is you can add, you know, calcium carbonate to mm -hmm. it or something. So part of the beauty of, of like lead is that it has like this short paint chunky effect that kind of drags and stutters as it goes across the painting. And if you want that effect with titanium, you can add, you can add um, uh, calcium carbonate to it and it'll, it'll do something of a similar nature. Yeah, I remember seeing you first do that um, last year. There's a ceramic supply store nearby um, and Lewis went and got a bunch of calcium carbonate. I was like, "Were well, you working with clay? What are you doing? And he's like, no, I'm mixing in the paint. Um, and, you know, from a ceramics background, I had never thought of doing that. Um, so if you are interested in trying that technique and don't know where in the world to get calcium carbonate, anywhere that sells ceramic supplies should sell some of that. Mm-hmm. 
good stuff. Boy, you know, if you look at a real skull, this is the difference between getting like a plastic skull and a real skull. If you look at, get a real skull, you, there's these transparency, translucency moments in it where the light passes through and it heats it up at different rates and it creates this like warming and cooling effect throughout the skull and it's just awesome. It's like buttery, I, yeah. yeah, it's so nice. Like the light is scattering through the bone and creating like just the most subtle beautiful like cast of red in some of the areas of like deep shadow on the inside of the skull. For example, I haven't gotten in there yet, but in this part of the eye socket, from my vantage point, there's a really gorgeous orange, like orangey red uh, color that's gonna come in. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a real skull to play around with and you know, you're not maybe getting that effect, um, you can also Google, um, like, you know, if you have like a fake skull from something, Google what a real skull from that thing would look like, and you can try to mimic that effect as well um, if you don't have access to a real skull. Also, I think there are maybe some really good high res images of skulls that have good light passing through them. I'm not sure where they are, but I, I feel like I've run across a couple online that could be helpful. Kind of blocking in a little bit of these like peachy notes, and they're super. They're super subtle. Well, I think it calls for a declaration that I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Who would have thought? You know, kind of like halfway in, that's not bad. Not bad for me to like wait that long. There you go. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna put that in there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of just made it look like it has glowing red eyes, but it does actually, from my vantage point, have this vibrant orange on the inside of the eye socket. Um, it's really cool. Yeah, man. I'm finally gonna switch to a different brush after a little bit. Let's get a filbert. And sometimes just paintings are yummy, you know? I, there's no other way to say it. They're just, I, want, I just wanna like, um, just chomp down on them, they're so, <laughs> so yummy. I feel like every time I look at one of Erica's rose paintings, I'm just like, <laughs> Yep. Yum. Wanna munch on it. E Erica has this sweet, cutest little dog, and the dog makes this little sound that's sort of it's is it it's it's inside voice right it's yes. this inside bark <laughs> and it's the cutest thing she's shown us photo uh, she's showed us photos of him doing this or videos and he just makes this little hum sound but we have adopted that from Enzo the dog and here whenever we see a painting that just is so yummy you just can't stand it we we make that sound we go, oh, mm. you just want to chomp it Yep. I feel like that should be one of our East Oaks trademark sounds. <laughs> we should record like a sound bit of it to have. Love it. To press a button. <laughs> oh yeah, on our, on our uh, soundboard, yeah. that'd be great. I'll send you a video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna come over to your house with like professional recording gear. <laughs> uh, okay, Enzo, and Enzo's just gonna stare at me. <laughs> Take 237. Exactly. Come on, Enzo. <laughs> <laughs> there 
everybody knows the dog won't do tricks if, as soon as you get your guest over to, to observe, observe them and be like, look, my dog can you know, sit, roll over, play dead all at once. None of the above will happen. None. Are they mining today? Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, um, you know what? I don't know. I don't know what that is. something. Sounds like, yeah. We have a quarry very close to our house, and every now and again we'll hear them blow dynamite because we'll hear a, a bit of a rumble. It's never, it's never uh, startling, but you, you do notice it. I honestly don't usually even notice it anymore. I think I've gotten so used to it. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I guess I do need to put in a bit of an eye socket here. Nikki says the paintings are looking really good. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope y'all are enjoying it as much as we are. Put in a little bit of this background over here. I want to hear some more really bad artist jokes. And you get bonus if it happens to be a Halloween joke too. Ooh. If you can find an artist Halloween slash dad joke, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, you win the prize. Cross genre. <laughs> yeah. Trifecta. We do love our jokes here. Yes. Bonus points if you, if you two or me can come up, whoever comes up with one first in their own head. I'm, I'm of dad joke age, so I, I, should, I should be able to do this. Let's see if I can. <laughs> While painting. <laughs> I want to kind of like just make some like notes really quick with some of my brush strokes. Um, cause I do kind of want to, I'm itching to go back up in the antlers for a little bit, but I want to sort of notate, uh, the structure of like kind of the top of the nose bridge, um, where a lot of these plates are meeting on the skull. Um, cause I do want to go back in and kind of communicate that really subtle, um, undulation of the subforms coming in. Um, but just for the sake of time. Feeling a little anxious to go back in on the antlers or horns. Antlers? Antlers, I well, think. Huh? I'm not positive. No. Whatever they yeah. are, yeah. Horn slash antlers. <laughs> well, because I guess antlers technically would be a type of horn, maybe? Yeah, it could be one of those all, all antlers are horns, but not all horns are antlers situation. There, there we go. All I know is deer have antlers, so um, so these might be horns, you know. Yeah. But it is in the deer family, right? Um, it is, I believe. Um, although now that I think about it, I think it actually technically would be horns because they. Don't. I was telling Lewis when we were setting split. up. Yeah, the horns themselves are not actually physically attached to the skull. Um, they lift off, and if you were to lift one up and look underneath it, there's a like little like nubbin, I guess, so to speak, <laughs> uh, where the skull kind of comes up underneath and there's like a core inside of it that's made out of that same skull bone. Um, you gotta love a nubbin. Gotta get those nubbins. I don't know, what else would you call that? It's a nubbin. Yeah, it's a nubbin. That's the technical term. Yeah, I love it. We're very technical I'm, here. I'm loving a nubbin. Oh my goodness, all right. All right.
Let me go back over to the background really quick and see if I can push the drawing in just a, in a few spots. You know, it's it's okay to like go over, kind of the, go over the lines a little bit with, with the background because then you can bring the, fore, the foreground paint on top of it and it creates a nice interesting edge work. So don't be afraid to pull the background over top where should be the drawing of the of the skull. I feel like he's got some sinister vibes in his eyes right now. I know, mine looks like straight up evil. <laughs> like the way that I have this orangey glow in the eye. I don't know, I'm kind of loving it, but um, there's definitely some spooky vibes about it. Feels very seasonally appropriate so far. Yeah. When the two artists had an argument, they decided to call it a draw. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Tried to paint a good picture of a sky, but I blew it. Yeah. Brilliant. That is awesome. But I blew it. <laughs> These are so good, everybody. Keep them coming. You're, you're giving us paint fuel with all your fabulous jokes. Emily says, I'm getting Maleficent vibes, loving these. Yeah. I think you said something like that yesterday. Yeah. I did, yeah. I feel like something, the horns seem like a very similar kind of shape to that, I think. I, I actually wonder if they were used these horns in order to, because if you think about the skull, the skull even kind of has a narrow approach similar to the dragon in Maleficent. Mm. It's, you know, it's got a really narrow snout and very pointy. So... I, uh, yeah, I feel like, I feel like that it's got to be something close to that. I feel like that would make a pretty cool Halloween costume. Oh, man. What is everybody going, is anyone going to a Halloween get together and dressing up? And if you are, what are you going as? We have a question here. Mm -hmm. Watching Evie and Lewis, it's fascinating how we interpret color differently. I wonder if it is a difference in physiology, rods and cones, or are individual perceptions so powerful they alter reality? Mm. Thoughts on individual color perception. Mm. Well, if you go back to probably what, 2014, 15, and see if the dress is blue and black <laughs> or white and gold, that should answer part of that question for you. So it's... It's not necessarily that we see perception incredibly different. It, we actually do. Um, and it's funny because um, people in Africa actually can see variations of beige far more accurately than we can. And we can see in, in like the U.S. see variations of green far more accurately than they can. Interesting. Yeah. I never knew that. And partially, scientists, I think, still wonder if it's, um, if it's a trained thing or a genetic thing. But one, one way or another, um, it is conducive to the environment that they're set in. And so 
a lot of perception when we're training artists is training them not only, when we say training how to see, or one of the things we're talking about is training people to visualize new color and pay attention to colors that they didn't even know they were capable of seeing. And another great uh, scientific evidence of this is that I think it's like one in every 26,000 or something crazy like this. Um, there are females that are tetrachromates, which means that they have an extra genetic mutation of a cone in their eye that can receive another range of color wavelength that men can't see, or the, the majority of the population can't see, and all of men can't see, because um, it only occurs in females. And um, they've taken people that are tetrachromates, that they have discovered to be tetrachromates, and they've shown them color swatches of the subtle differences of these colors, and they can't tell the difference. And the reason being is, is that there's nothing that's primed their mind to seeing them seeing it. Um, so all the color and all the things that we have in our world are designed, you know, signs and advertising and that kind of stuff are designed for people who don't see with that fourth cone. So, but the other thing that they've learned is that it's also that they have to be trained to see it. It can't be just the fact that they have the receptors to see it. So um, it's just one of those fascinating things about how our mind works. For the longest time in ancient texts, there, there wasn't a definition of the color blue. So like Iliad and the Odyssey, um, the Old Testament and Bible scripture, um, Dead Sea Scrolls and other places have no mention all the other colors except for blue. And a lot of people believe that that is because they, it was a more rare color in nature aside from the fact that it was coming, you know, aside from the fact that you have the sky. But because it didn't occur much in nature, they didn't have a defined term for it. Also, to add to that, that's amazing. I knew almost none of that. That's really cool. Um, Another contributing factor that I've read um, to that effect is actually pigments, the presence of historical pigments and dyes, um, of which blue is pretty uncommon. You know, the big one, is, of course, is indigo. Um, and indigo lake is historically a pigment. But um, until you see a lot of lapis and... Um, what was called Tyrian purple, which was then used to make royal blue or royal purple. Um, there's not a whole lot of it. And the reason for that is um, Tyrian purple as a pigment is actually extracted from a particular species of murex shell, um, which is a... Oh... I forget if it's a bivalve or a like isopod, I don't know, some kind of sea critter. Um, and I mean, they're teeny, teeny, tiny, and each one gives you maybe a fraction of a drop of that color. So um, in ye olden times of, you know, like the Ottoman Empire, ancient Greece, etc., cetera, um, ancient Egypt, um, a lot of these pigments were actually traded um, as being more valuable than gold because they were. Um, because it would take quite literally several million of these organisms to create enough paint to work with or enough dye to dye a piece of cloth with. Um, so that could be another historical reason for why not a lot of blue. There you go. Erica is, you, you got a classics degree, correct? Um, I sure did. And have you 
run across this thought of the uh, color blue not being in ancient texts? So I was just remembering how, for example, I don't, I don't remember so specifically, but I think this might be from the Odyssey. Maybe it's from the Iliad, regardless. The wine dark sea, that's mm -hmm. how they would describe, versus like the dark blue sea, as an mm. example. And so often the language is, like that word is, the word that was used for this is used to describe things that are not only uh, red, or dark red, but also dark blue. It's kind of all encompassed mm -hmm. in, in one thing, in one word. That's uh, a really good point. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the closest other color, at least scripturally, that um, that they've found is uh, purple or violet. They have they mentioned that color several times, but they but never never blue. The wine dark sea. Yep. If y'all want to hear a really interesting podcast on it, Radio Lab, and how we see. Is a really excellent. It's where I learned a lot of this information. So check it out because it's awesome. Louis mm -hmm. has a podcast for everything. I yeah. swear, <laughs> I love it. Honestly, every anytime I'm like, I need something new to listen to. I'll tell you every single time he's gonna have something that I love. So funny enough, there I, I think it's on Hulu. They have a commercial where it talks about that guy who knows that there's a podcast for everything. And it's just this guy walking around the office being like, oh, I have a podcast. You like teas? I have a podcast for you to listen about teas. And like we listen to it and Parisa just like turns and looks at me and is like, that's you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, guilty as charged. Um, it's I, a know. good thing. And I, so like, I'm grateful for it. <laughs> He, he's in like a meeting and the lady's like, John, are you paying attention? Uh, she's here. He's like, are you, what are you, are you listening to a podcast? He's like, yeah, I'm listening to a podcast on multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lewis, have you ever listened to a podcast on multitasking? I no. I, I've definitely listened to one on, um, on like, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Productivity. There you go. You know, okay. Definitely have listened to many on productivity. But, you know, the only thing I've learned from podcasting about multitasking is that multitasking doesn't actually exist the way we think it does. Ooh. Which is really interesting. You um, care to extrapolate on that? It basically is making a statement that we continue to switch our mind, and some people are better at switching their mind over from one task to another more quickly, which actually is a connection to intelligence in one sense because it is how quickly you can switch over from prob what they call problem space. Um, and in order to create problem solving skills, um, but, and that was a very interesting podcast I had listened to one time. <laughs> cool. I listened to a lovely podcast last week um, I was actually telling Chelsea Bard about it over the weekend. Um, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I feel like, I don't know. As artists, we kind of have a lot of auditory downtime working in the studio. So, you know, some people like music, some people like podcasts, some people like me like both. Um, and I found a podcast that I was listening to last week that was made by the BBC um, that talks about witchcraft and the history of witchcraft and tis the season. Um, it was really compelling actually and um, did a really like good job of kind of having a deep dive into um, connecting that history with the relevance of certain social movements in the UK presently. Um, so I would recommend that one to anybody needing a podcast. Well, that's cool. I think it's literally just called Witch <laughs> from the Excuse BBC. Excuse me. Hold on. Bless you. <laughs> Excuse me, everyone. <clears throat> I think there is, I don't know, I was telling Lewis earlier, um, my fiance has been having some allergies, and I think 
right now. There is something in the air here. Fall allergies are afoot right now. You know, I'm actually uh, impressed that I haven't sneezed over the course of all of these live streams back to back until now. You know, that's a good um, point. Actually, you haven't. That's that's kind of incredible. I would have bet against me on that one. Lewis has amazing, booming, ginormous sneezes that uh, I don't know. Whenever. Whenever we hear it from in the studio when you're in here painting, <laughs> Tina and I always look at each other and just kind of chuckle. <laughs> it is, uh, it's brutal. Uh, absolutely brutal. I'm, I'm trying really hard to hold my, my sneeze in right now. Aww. But my, my um, I always say I get it from my grandfather. My grandfather, he could, he could wake the dead with his sneeze. And it would come from nowhere. Like all of a sudden he'd just be normal and he'd just be like, Hasha! Hasha! And, you know, everybody jumped out of their socks and then um, it'd be fine again. But, and then I ended up being that guy. Hey, it's a family tradition. <laughs> exactly. We have some comments here mentioning in the Old Testament different mentions of the color blue. I personally would be curious to learn about the translation process. Mm, mm -hmm. They're saying that they've found um, some passages that, that are being translated as the color blue? Yes. Hmm. Well, isn't that interesting? Well, and I think it's such a, such a fun thing to think about, too, in like the context of evolution as sort of like a living, not evolution, the evolution of language as being kind of a living, breathing thing. Um, because, you know, today we say, oh, like, are you feeling blue? Like, are you feeling sad? Mm -hmm. um, because of our psychic emotional connection to color. And that wasn't always the case. So um, I think that color offers a really exciting uh, window into, like, I don't know, just like ancient historic cultures. Yeah. Um, yeah, we love being nerdy here. In case you couldn't tell. Oh, man. And then Alyssa writes, Leonardo wrote in his notebooks that the complementary color of blue was yellow-red. Uh, researchers discovered that Leonardo hadn't made an error, but that orange wasn't named until after the Renaissance. Interesting. I wonder, orange the color wasn't named after the Renaissance? Until after the Renaissance? Yeah, and actually, um, I wonder if what I, they referred to as for the fruit. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, that's in the same podcast. They actually mention it. Of course, you have. They, like they I said, said, he's got a podcast. For it's, me. It was on the same podcast. <laughs> I promise, it was the same one on Radio Lab. And they had mentioned um, that the fruit named the color, I believe, um, and then it was like the same went on the same suit, and there they. I feel like it was, gosh, I want to make sure that one, that one I need to like double check on the facts on, but I, I'm pretty sure it was that way. It was, they definitely mentioned it. I just can't remember if that's, if that's the route that it went where it was the fruit that named, that named the color. It's kind of like the color version of the chicken and the egg, which came first. Right, exactly. That's really interesting. I never knew that. It was one of those things that like it comes back to my memory when somebody said that, and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember hearing, you know. Um, hearing about such the phenomena or, or situation that happened. Mm, mm, mm. There are also going. mentions about the Egyptians are creating the first blue pigment. I think it's interesting. Um, it's not that people didn't know about the color or didn't see the color ever. I think it has to do with more with like what the word means and mm -hmm. how much it encompasses. Mm, that's good.
Maybe uh, for another lecture idea, we could do the history of color. Oh, love it. I do love that Instagram account. What is it? Like Jackson's? Oh, yes. So good. Oh. So interesting. I love I how they put that together. I was like on it and I noticed that all of y'all liked it and I was like, yep, yep, I love it too. They just <laughs> released a video, if not yesterday, it was maybe the day before, um, of like taking a quick little tour inside the Michael Harding mm -hmm. oh. uh, factory. Um, and it had a quick clip of some paint being milled on these giant rollers and you mm -hmm. see all this gloopy goodness coming out so of it. Cool. It's so nice. It's a good time. I'm very interested to hear about the passage of scripture that they were talking about because I want to like look up the original text. Um, like the, the either the Greek translation or or the Hebrew, to see what the direct translation of the word was originally. That'd be really cool. I kind of nerd out on things like that. Love it. I kind of nerd out just with like historiography in general, which mm. is the, the practice and process of recording history. And the implications of like human influence upon recorded history, um, and learning about that in a way to kind of like help maintain a healthy skepticism, I think, of certain histories. Mm. Um, yeah, I love that. I don't know. It is fun to be curious about everything. I think as painters, we're like naturally curious. Yes. Reese says, Lewis, it's mostly an exodus. Oh, sweet. Gonna look it up. It's too bright. And to answer the question about the Instagram handle, it's uh, Jackson's Art Supplies, and their account is Jackson's underscore art. Yeah, honestly, I would, I would advise caution, though, to some, because what happened to me when I first discovered it, um, <laughs> I entered a time vortex where suddenly three hours of my life were gone. Um, so that's the caveat of good content, I guess. <laughs> you get sucked yep. in. Lewis, do you know the term for these areas where the plates on the skull meet and they're like stitched together? Is there a term for that? The stitching of it is called, they're actually called sutured, sutures. Oh. So like it's really that easy in, that a, in a way. Um, but aside from calling them plates, uh, I'm not sure if there is any better term for like this specific skull. But oftentimes they're, at least in the cranial section, they're, they're called plates. So... Erica, you have any insights on that? Sorry, I was reading some of the comments. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about, is there any other uh, term for, um, aside from the suture, uh, oh, sutures no of idea. the plates, and is do some of the plates have other names aside from plates? This is not my area of expertise. Gotcha. To say. You mean you're not an osteologist? <laughs> Maybe in a... Life. We totally want to get one osteologist here to look at our skeleton to see. I want to learn more about it. There. Hmm. It was uh, a, a generous gift from another artist friend. And um, We'll have to post a picture of it to the Discord maybe to show folks. 
Because I feel like we've mentioned it several times this Oh, month. have we? Okay, yeah, yeah totally. To answer someone who was asking whether I'm on the Discord, I am not yet on the Discord. Oh, join, join the club. The water's fine. And we have another mention here uh, uh, regarding uh, the history of blue. I think we're going to have to like really dig into this. So uh, there are 49 times the Bible mentions the color blue, but it was impossible to describe, yet for the most of the last 2,000 years, nobody has known exactly what biblical blue, I think there's a particular word for it in Hebrew, is. And so I think there's more to the story linguistically. Mm, yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it, it, it's more closely related to violet, if, if, uh, if I remember, because I like wanted... After I heard the podcast, I was like, what? You know, and I like went to go check it out. And it was so long ago now that I need to go recheck it out to see <laughs> what, what it was all about. But there was something there with that. So, but I love that people are so interested in uh, these conversations. This is, this is why these are fun. It's like... We, we can all we be nerdy to, together. We all get Yay. to be nerdy together and like learn something new and... Um, I'm I'm one that I'm always I welcome people to prove if I say anything to 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 prove it otherwise because um, I'm more interested in learning the truth of a matter than I am about being right. I think it's more about the complexity of language and color. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. I totally agree. Well, and it's also really curious to hear about it in the context of the Bible, because admittedly, I, embarrassingly, have actually never read the Bible. Probably should at some point, um, just, you know, to do it. Um, but, you know, to think about it in the context of, of spirituality, uh, the spiritual connection that people historically have had to color, mm. um, I think is a really compelling idea i love that and feel it too you know i think mm -hmm. that's something i feel myself yeah we have a few more people saying hello hello back hi from join the party hi from scott hello scott Interesting um, additions here, mentioning the Latin word for orange. Um, we also have um, an addition to one of the previous comments uh, about the, one of the biblical passages. Basically, they're trying to describe the color, but not necessarily directly stating that the color is blue. Mm. And so that's also interesting to note. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have about 55 minutes left. Man, this went by so quick. I know. 55 minutes. I don't want to stop. I know. So now that both of you have covered a majority of the canvas. What challenges are you facing with this one stroke at a time method? Mm, I think that, you know, I think as long as I do the one stroke method, usually what I'm fearful of is keeping it fresh. And the, the nature of the stroke helps that not be more of the problem. Um, I think now it's making sure that I don't damage some of the really interesting stuff I've already put down. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, kind of like 
clean everything up to where now it's like about the design of, of the, the painting and making the design of the painting look cool. Um, you know, as I'm getting closer to, to finishing out the, the skull and it, it's more about like warm and cool relationships, like making a, a interesting color notes and um, finding moments where there might be some cool subforms that are happening where I can like play around with those as well. So it's not so much any issue of paint application or technique that you're coming across. Like the method that you're using right now of one stroke at a time, you're not really running into any issues. Right, well I'm not, uh, yeah, the challenge kind of has built into it that you, something that typically is uh, something I have to consider, it, it's kind of built into the challenge as long as I do the rules of the challenge, I, I don't think I have to worry as much about that part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's more about like keeping the rules to heart but trying to create like cool subforms where light is hitting specific spots and I don't know, not killing the vibe. If you were doing this, Erica, what would you find to be the challenge for you? I think I need to try this challenge. Yeah, you should. I feel like your work already has a bit of that design in it. Yeah, I feel like your mark making feels like you're doing a really good job of dropping back down to your palette. Yeah, I always love hearing Erica talk about her work. Like, she's so sweet. Like, I swear to God, like, probably at the end of every single day, I go in and poke my head in her studio and bug her like, hey, can I see the peek? Thank um, you. Yeah, I just, I love hearing you talk about your process. It's, she's very good at articulating um as as she goes so thank you guys yeah i feel like every time i'm on here you <laughs> say some so many sweet things about my work i appreciate it of course That's i do cool. think um i i do pay attention to what what the person how do i say this you mentioned how I'm being articulated. Uh, now I can't say that. <laughs> um, I try to pay attention to essentially the feeling that you get from the kinds of marks that are put down in the painting. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to think critically when I'm looking at my own work about how the marks are influencing the experience that the viewer is having. Yeah. And I remember doing a, um, a shell study, I think it was about a year ago, and I was just looking at the whole thing and noticing that most of my marks were quite small and short. And it was a painting that I was doing as a kind of a trial, so I wasn't necessarily the most confident about what I was, uh, my approach. And so there were some, I was experimenting with some different things and um, so basically, I was, had some insecure mark making happening. Lots of short, uh, hesitant marks that were fussy in some areas and things like that. And so when I stood back from the painting, I'm like, eh, this, this just feels uptight. It feels, uh, I, I could feel my insecurity looking at my own painting. And so uh, I tried to counter it with longer marks, I try to counter it with how um, making marks where I make sure to decide what they mean before I put them down mm -hmm. versus observing after and trying to correct them. I try, I try to make as many decisions as possible uh, before putting the mark down. And so I find that when I do that, I'm happier with the result. And that doesn't mean that um, every mark is perfect. It just, um, there's a certain, there's Purpose. a certain energy behind the mark that reads when you are, when you stand back from it. That's awesome. And so it's a lot of, 
lot of stepping back and uh, trying to trying to imagine that you haven't seen the painting before and taking stock of how it feels. Mm. Feels good. Well said, Eric. Thank you. I want to very carefully and perhaps even like maybe crudely, like very quickly, just try to really um, tick off some of these teeth that I can just barely see on the side here, but they do add kind of a unique textural variation where um, it's a lot of like really jagged short moments um, that are kind of lacking from the rest of the form. So I think that that could offer a little extra visual interest on the side here. If I made that too light. Also something I'm considering while we're working on it that I want to make sure I get done the way I want it to be done is the edge work, you know, and that's part of the fun challenge of this at these stages is because like if you're making a single mark, you got to make sure that you are mixing a bit of the, um, the average of the two colors a bit in order for you to create a soft edge as something transitions over. Or just the opposite, where you're you're creating a nice fresh mark, and using the right kind of brush to help make something have a bit more of a stronger edge. So that's something I'm also considering while I'm making each mark individual, because it's much easier to like just you know go two or three times over a, a section to soften the edge, but this kind of adds a bit more energy if you can create the edge into it a little bit and then pull it back out again with just one mark. We have, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Frentis from Denmark. I've been following the recordings and I'm thrilled to catch a live one. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah, that's great. So happy you're here. And uh, there'll be many more to come. If you want to catch more live ones, if you haven't already, just if you sign up for our email list, there should be a opportunity to a link to do that in the description below, and um, and you'll get notified when whenever we do them. Or if you subscribe and click the bell, it'll also notify you. So, um, but we're happy to have you. Uh, please ask questions if you have any. Um, if there's something you've wanted to know about. We're here for you. This is probably one of my favorite brushes for like drapery and you know, kind of stuff of that sort is uh, my handy dandy Eclipse Stacker from Rosemary. Can you put it more towards this? A little bit more to the left, a little bit farther down? Ah. Down, a little bit to the, <laughs> yep, left, down. Perfect. Yay! We got there. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Good teamwork. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Eclipse Dagger. This is a quarter inch dagger. Um, I love it. Um, it has so much versatility in the quality of line that you can achieve in just one single stroke. Um, almost like 
and almost like thinking about it in terms of like calligraphy or something, um, where you really can use your wrist in different ways. And even like, I like to like roll it between my fingers sometimes to affect the way that it sweeps across. So like here, I'll make a mark kind of with that where I'll start out, start to roll my fingers and just push and back. Grab some more paint. Like the amount of like, Variation in line that you can achieve with this guy. So much fun to play with. Alyssa wrote something sweet. She said, thank you, Erica, for the Carlson, uh, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting book recommendation. I love that book. I find myself, even if I'm not landscape painting at all, I'm just needing a a reset, I'll, I'll look through his wisdom mm. in that book. Um, really, just really interesting approach. And he, uh, Alyssa writes, I love how he talked about mark making and feeling each mark. That's awesome. Scott also appreciates uh, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. Is that Scott Jones or is that a different Scott? We have Scott Ruthven Fine Art is his handle. Oh, cool. Yes. Welcome, welcome. That's awesome. All right. Trying to think about the next move. I might go back up into the horn slash antlers. <laughs> Where are we at on time? We are at 418. Perfect. And start cleaning up that for a bit. I like the way that um, the drapery is set up. It kind of like has some undulations that are playing really nicely with the way that these horns move mm. um so trying to like hone in on that and capture a little bit of like that drama yeah it's great i'm really glad we put that cloth back there oh yeah so good, good isn't it yeah it helps a lot louie and i had a lot of fun <laughs> sort of macgyvering this uh setup yeah, <laughs> it was. It was a good time. Took a few tries, but we got there. That's what matters. Frentis writes, I'm quite new to painting, but do you consider what type of brush you use? I find hog bristles make lovely distinct marks with abstraction, but hard to control when painting multiple layers a la prima. Um, yes, what I would suggest if you have experience with hog's hair is that in the later stages, switch over to a softer brush um, that, you, that will allow you to um, not push around the, the paint as much. So it's kind of like you lay down all of your heavy paint at the beginning, and then as you continue near the end of your painting, you can switch over to say a faux mongoose would be a good example. Um, I'll, I'll pull out one or two, because that would be nice to paint with one anyway, near this, this stage of this painting. But um, basically, a brush like this, which is an Eclipse comb brush, that is made by Rosemary, and they do uh, a wonderful job of allowing your, your painting to keep a lot of its essence from the original marks, but uh, continue for you to pursue um, softer, more subtle marks.
but I'm so glad you're joining. And welcome to the adventure of painting. It is quite an adventure. I always got to keep remembering as I get later stages for some reason, like it wasn't hard for me to remember early for early on, but for some reason later on it, I've got to go, oh yeah, I've got to make sure I'm making it go back to the palette and get some more, some more paint. Everybody must be mildly quiet today. It's been a long week for everybody, right? It's Tuesday. <laughs> I know. That's, that's exactly the joke. <laughs> like, oh man, it's already long. I remember making the joke um, what, New Year's Day of 2021? Mm -hmm. God, it's been such a long year. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Francis writes, thanks for the advice. I've just ordered a couple of Eclipse combers as an early Christmas gift yesterday. Oh, oh good. Well, there you go. That's awesome. Well, you have the right brushes on your way. The last big order I put in with Rosemary was, I think, around Thanksgiving last year, perhaps? I think it was around Thanksgiving. And... Um, it was so cute. They included a sweet little handwritten note, um, you know, thanking me for getting some brushes from them and supporting them. And um, they gave me, I don't know if they still have this as like a promotion or not, but they gave me several of these. Um, they're just a, what I would say, maybe a number six round mm -hmm. bristle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it doesn't have a series or anything, but... Um, yeah, they're so sweet. They're super generous. They make a good product. In this part of the stage of the painting, I'm just kind of like kind of pushing and pulling a few things around a little bit. Always being mindful to go back to my palette and yet again trying to keep the painting feeling fresh. Not as much about being accurate on this exercise. It's more for me, it's more about like kind of keeping energy into yeah. the piece. Yeah, like I, I ended up having to kind of um, honestly kind of like squish my horns a bit proportionally mm, mm -hmm. um, honestly just so that they fit um, I'm kind of kicking myself a little bit because before we started filming Lewis was talking about like oh yeah I want to choose a bigger panel for this one I'm kind of like oh I wish I did that 
Um, <laughs> but that's yeah, your color study. It'll set you up. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I would really love to paint this guy again soon. Has anybody thought of name ideas? For naming the antel the the um Blesbach? The, the Blesbach. Blesbach. Gosh, I always forget that name. It's a tough, funny name. Stephanie writes something uh, nice. She wrote Curse of Writing is being added back to many school curriculum because of its benefits to brain development, memory, and creativity. Look at that. That's good. Awesome. We were Boy. just talking about that, Lewis. Yeah, we were. Not too long ago. My, um, my grandmother was a calligrapher, and Erica and I were talking about, like, when I was very young, I found some old letters from, like, a distant cousin or uncle from the Civil War writing back to his wife. And the handwriting was so beautiful, and I loved it so much that my grandmother bought me some... Spencerian script handwriting books, which were was the common way to write and be educated with penmanship back in that day. Hmm. And um, I loved them. I actually still have them on the shelf in, in the other room. And um, so Eric and I were talking about how important that that still is to our writing that we, you know, I feel like as, as artists, we want to do many things beautifully if we can. And um, it is it's just one of those things that I still do and it kind of uh, keeps my grandmother alive in my mind. That's beautiful. Yeah, my mom was a calligrapher actually. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I mean, man, it shows. If you ever see just like her normal daily handwriting, it's... Like, oh, I'm sure it's just what? one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, but as a kid, I was always so jealous of my mom's pretty handwriting that um, I tried really, really hard when learning cursive in school and actually um, have kept it. Uh, my normal handwriting is cursive. Um, and I know that that is honestly not very common anymore for a lot of folks, mm -hmm. at least my age. But... Um, I'm happy to hear that. I think uh, it would be very sad if a lot of schools got rid of that in their curriculum. Yeah, would I'm be. happy that at least, um, as this user wrote, that it's being recognized as not just, oh, we're just doing some pretty handwriting. You know yeah. what I mean? That yep. there's more to it than that. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm actually cheating a little bit here for <gasps> just a quick second. No. I am using all these mixtures up here, um, if you can see on my palette, are for a different painting I'm working on. But one of them is actually kind of a mixture I need, so I'm stealing a little bit of this other mixture, um, which is actually just a mixture of ivory black, ultramarine blue, and um, manganese violet. Um, just a nice, cool, dark. I don't know if it's actually cheating, but I don't know. But cheating. Yeah. I don't think we laid out those rules at the beginning. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki writes, we all have our distinctive mark making and it shows in our penmanship too. Mm. I love how with realism, even if you are making an accurate uh, representation of your subject, your penmanship can still come through in your handwriting and individuality and your mark making and what information you're prioritizing. I, I just think that's so cool that yeah. you can still find distinction in different paintings, even if the result is you know, more realistic. Yeah, I love that. That's well said. Although, I got to say it, y'all, I really hate signing paintings. Um, <laughs> I really just hate it. I wish I could hire somebody to do it for me. I really just, I, 
It feels like, I don't know if anybody else out there feels this way, but to me it feels like there's some kind of hubris in it for me where it's like, this is mine. Or, um, I don't know, I also just don't like the act of like painting my name. Um, By or, Evie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I also have a really weird name, and so a lot of people are like, what does that say? And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Whatever. Um, yeah, you know, the like more illegible your signature is, the fancier it is, right? You know, it's fine. It's supposed to be that way. You're an artist. <laughs> we have a good question here. When you talk about fresh, are you talking about preserving the initial paint strokes? Can you elaborate on how you define fresh in your paintings, mm. Lewis? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example. So say over here in this part of the painting, you know, since it's the background, I have all of this like interesting texture going on. I have a little bit of the background showing, I have a little bit of warm, a little bit of cool, and it feels like I just painted it, right? And so, but if I go in and I keep working it, and I keep working it, and I keep working it, and keep working it, like all of a sudden, all that character goes away in, in that part of it. Now, however, if I go back to my canvas and I add something to it and I push in a certain way, the, ex the act of having more paint on my brush or in some cases less paint or a different color can create more energy of it feeling like it was just painted. So it's not necessarily that you're trying to preserve what you painted at the beginning, but you're making it feel like it was painted only once. Hmm. So I hope that was helpful. I think, I think that's as close as I can get to answering that question uh, without having to really think about it um, and write you know, a thoughtful commentary on it. So and I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with is, is like learning how to push a painting and keep you can like you can work on a painting for honestly forever if you're really good at understanding how to switch techniques up in a way that allows for it to feel like it was just painted once. So uh, one of the reasons for going back to the palette is, is you get fresh paint every time, and it looks like fresh paint every time you put it down. I think there's something as well to uniformity, feeling um, dead, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. So if your surface texture or paint application is, and mark making is repetitive, it can feel dead or mm. and so almost like freshness is almost like the opposite of that where you're having a unique stroke a meaningful stroke and it's not repetitive so it does so it has meaning because it is it's like it's where it's supposed to be if that yeah makes sense. <laughs> yeah totally And like having those declarative marks just remain um, in and of themselves and not feeling the need to like work slash overwork them. Mm -hmm. I think of it too, um, every, when you're putting a mark down, you're putting your thoughts down. And so if you kind of rework it or blend it or in an overly done way, then you're kind of erasing all of your thoughts about what you're thinking about during when you're putting down the mark. Mm. And so by going over it, you're almost like uh, erasing those thoughts. I think it's cool to leave them behind and you can work with them without necessarily killing them. And it's, 
I think it takes practice and observing your own paint application and trial and error to figure out what that limit is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in conjunction to what you're saying is, is like making, getting rid of what does it feel thoughtful? You know, like if you're putting your thoughts down, but you weren't being very thoughtful about it, mm -hmm. you know, this, it, you finding a way to freshly get rid of an area that you're like, you know what? I was thinking about football right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't really thinking about the painting or I wasn't being mindful enough to care enough about what I was painting. And so it's your opportunity to also do, do that. That's great, great thoughts, Erica. So Joyce has a question. Uh, she's ready to post her painting, but needs to be reminded of what the name of the East Oak site designated for the viewers is called. Well, it is called East Oak Studio. It's on Discord, which is a sort of a chat messaging app. Uh, so you need to get Discord, but the, the link is below. And uh, if you are on YouTube, it's below in the description. And you can go there and um, pull it off. So um, that's where you'll find it. And if you need any uh, further assistance with it, just let us know. thing I'm going to have it worked in enough is like some of the yellow as it turns into the shadow. Just pull in a few spots where the yellow is pushing into the shadow. Adding a little more yellow to the areas that need it. Nikki writes, just like we need the interesting grays, taupes, and neutrals to make more saturated points, or saturated color points pop, we need some softer blended areas to make stronger expressive brush strokes to read correctly. I think that's so true. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. We have such thoughtful, uh, such a thoughtful audience. I think this would also be a really fun um, brief for plein air painting and like really trying to focus on these like super deliberate standalone mm -hmm. brush strokes with plein air painting because the way that our brains um, interpret and communicate space on a two dimensional picture plane um, and the way that that can be impacted by these brush strokes, I think could be really, really fun um, to sort of play around with. Yep, totally. Yeah, like just, I'm loving the energy of this, this painting. Why we do it. How's it going over there, Evie? Pretty good, actually. I'm having a lot of fun with this. Um, it looks wicked. <laughs> I don't know what other <laughs> word to use. I mean, I think um, the way that I've also kind of like communicated some of these folds in the fabric behind it, it sort of looks like it's like on fire a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's very dramatic, kind of flowy angles happening. Um, 
Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <sighs> yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> just realized it's funny like you can spend so long painting something and then like oh I totally missed that part yep. there's this little like pockmark or I guess like little indentation where I guess um, the tear duct would have been where the optical nerve I guess is coming out of in the skull um, that's like right here and I totally missed that um, I always love moments like that though, where like, you know, even if you've spent all day looking at something, at the end of the day, you could be like, oh wow, where did that come from? Yeah. Um, just that, that process of discovery. Very gratifying. It is, it is very gratifying. Um, I'm gonna, I definitely am gonna incorporate this exercise even more into like a normal routine of mine because like I'm just really enjoying the result of it. It's kind of like you know, you know it by concept, but then like when you actually try it, you're like, oh yeah, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> What my teachers have been telling me all along. <laughs> exactly. I would have laughed, but I was trying really hard to like get this like one little mark. And so I was like, <laughs> yep, exactly. Or it's like the thing that I've been teaching other people to do all uh, it yes. actually works. Hey, practice what you I, preach. Uh huh. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, man. I heard that a lot growing up. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my mom's catchphrase. <laughs> Love you, mom. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, mom. One painter that I'm thinking of who paints very clear, almost planar, yet me meaning like every brush stroke is a plane. Yeah. Yeah. Yet feels so connected is Edefelt. Edefelt. Um, Edefelt. I can't remember what his first name is. Um, How do you spell it's it? one of those situations where I'm like, I'm sure I know the work, but for some reason I can't. Albert Edefelt. He's Finnish, Swedish, um, but in when I was a student at Florence Academy, we had his uh, figure paintings, like his academic nudes, uh, on the walls as guidance and inspiration for us to look mm -hmm. at um, as examples. And so cool to look up close because from far away, of course, it's like you know, it looks like light flowing over skin, and then uh, you go close, and each plane is clear so and understood, oh. and it's really fascinating. So the brush strokes might not be as maybe like sketchy or energetic in that sense, but each stroke put down um, is meaningful, and it's just really interesting. Mm. I'll so have to it's, look him up. Uh, not familiar. His last name is Edelfelt. E D E L F E L T, and he has um, different academic nudes. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. I love that. I'll just show you guys later. The other thing I think that this seems to really help with is that you're you're being very considerate of 
the exact color you're trying to put down. Whereas we kind of go, oh, if I blend it in, it'll, it'll be fine, you know. And this, this helps kind of break some of those bad habits because if you're con very considerate about the, the mark you make and the color you're putting down, the whole thing will come to life a lot more. Emily asks, curious to hear what your favorite week has been so far from this October challenge. Man, that is question. hard. That is, a, that is a tough, tough question because I've had, if you haven't noticed, I have had so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. I think that the Big Paint Day was a real blast. And then Soft Edges Day with you, Erica, was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing the master copy of, of uh, Sargent. Um, that, was, that was like way cool, way hella fun. For me, honestly, today. Yeah, well, that makes sense too. I mean, today definitely is up there for sure. I have another good question. What other painters would you recommend looking up in regards to mark making? I'm thinking Sargent, Soroya are the obvious choices. Anybody else? Oh man, there's some really great, fabulous painters out there. Um, um, Renoir is one of my favorites. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? It's not, it's not Monk, um, but it's something like Monk. Uh, he, he used to paint um, like prize fighters um, in the rink and he, he had like crazy interesting something like painting. Monk as in like his name is similar or his uh -huh. work is similar name is similar to Monk it's like mm. y'all I have the worst name memory ever and so I apologize for that part because I should know this guy's name but anyway, he, he's, he's, uh, he would be excellent to look at. Um, but I'm trying to think of who else would be somebody excellent to look at for Mark making. Uh, well, Mancini. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Mancini a few days ago about how, how awesome, like just chunky, fun Mark making. Um, like Robert Henry. Robert Henry was uh, a heavy yeah. mark maker. So, and William Merritt Chase was too, wasn't he? Um, mm -hmm. I think he had a nice heavy hand. Um, some of Thomas Moran's work, if you're a landscape painter, he's got some beautiful work, mark making. Ilya Repin. Repin. Oh my gosh, Repin is. I mean, there's some. Russian painters out there that just are rockin' sockin'. I love the painting that he has in the Met. Oh. Um, and it's so fascinating. The portrait, it's, I think it's of a writer at a desk and looking at the viewer. He's wearing black and he has books on the table. And it's so interesting to see the different mark making that he has for, for example, the books, where he uses a, a, a stroke where the, uh, it's almost like with a bristle brush, so you could, it creates the lines of paper without mm. like painting the lines of the paper. Mm. And versus uh, the background, versus the skin, versus the eyes, like, you know, so much, and hair, like you're getting different marks for different materials, yet it all is cohesive. Really beautiful. I'll, have to, I'll find the title. Yeah, it's excellent. It's just, it's probably one of my favorite paintings in the Met. Me too. Just so well done. I might have a chance to go to the Met in the next couple months, and I'm what? really excited. Yeah. Well, then I'm so jelly. Maybe, um, though it'll be cold, 
around Christmas time, but. Great time to go to New York though. Yeah. Everyone, if you've never been to New York during Christmas season, it's, it is, it's uh, pretty magical. Jake wants to take me ice skating at uh, what? Bryant Park or That's the it. Central Park. Um, Bryant Park and there, there, there's like four different ones. There's uh, Bryant Park, um, Rockefeller Center. Rockefeller, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with the giant Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. I think of that, like my entire life, Home Alone ruined it for me. I think yeah, of that yeah. and I think of Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's Ex just a lifelong association. <laughs> like one of my favorite uh, scenes is um, when they're at this, when... Um, Marv is at the ice skating rink, but that's the Central Park one, and he's like beating away a pigeon. <laughs> and he's like, "Get out of here! Beat it! Beat it! Get out of here!" And I don't know. It's it's like great slapstick comedy. Uh, we watched was, that last Christmas. Together, we did. Didn't we? Oh, yeah. we did. Forgot about that. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, we are coming down to seven minutes, everybody. Oh gosh. Oh, this has just been such. A fun, enjoyable time with everyone today, y'all. We're we are down to the wire, Erica. You're, you know, as lovely as her voice is. You're going to see her even more lovely face tomorrow. Thank you. It's uh, we are going to be working for the next three days on a painting in layers, so or uh, also known as indirect painting, and uh, she will be joining me. And it's going to be a blast. We're going to be working from a model. We hope to see all of you there. And we want you to come with your questions, your jokes, your insights about blue. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. It's going to be a wild ride. Um, as always, I will post um, this painting once I'm done with it up on Discord. We'd love to see you there. Um, and as, uh, as I've said every time, we are so um, honored to be able to have made this whole series for everyone. And we say out of, out of gratitude, you know, we appreciate, we appreciate y'all so much. And out of gratitude, if y'all so desire and have found something enjoyable out of this, please just like uh, and click the subscribe button. Uh, we'll be making more of these in the future. Um, and it helps us out as well, be seen by more. So we really appreciate y'all um, as we work towards the, this beautiful end of this series. Um, well, I am going to say we can start wrapping it up, and we will be seeing y'all shortly. But thank y'all again for everything. And thank you to Evie for joining us and for providing this lovely, lovely skull. And uh, for Erica behind the switcher. Hello. Yep. Uh, we appreciate her absolutely for being back there helping us out. And for all of you for commenting, for creating such wonderful banter and building our community with us. We appreciate you. Join us on Discord. We'd love to see you there. We'll have wonderful conversations. We have a whole critique section. And uh, without further ado, y'all have a lovely night. Happy painting, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>